a challenge to dignity. Our goal was to link academics, activists, and agencies concerned with the health of refugees and asylum seekers in a spirit of collaboration and comparison, bringing together professionals working with different populations of forcibly displaced peoples, ethnic groups, and nations. The video you are watching will contain an individual presentation edited to stand alone. We hope you find them to be of value. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Morgan Chalmers. She is an MD PhD candidate in psychological and medical anthropology here at UC San Diego. Recording in and progress. Her dissertation is exploring reproductive decision making and access to care among Syrian refugees in Jordan. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, So to begin, I want to uh, thank my advisor, Dr. Shortish, for the opportunity to speak here today. In my talk, I hope to specifically highlight things that I've learned during my research with Syrian communities in San Diego and Jordan that will have relevance to researchers and providers beyond these specific settings. So my project began as a broad exploration of reproductive health after displacement among Syrian refugees in two very different field sites here in San Diego, California, where over 1,200 Syrians have been resettled, and in Jordan, which currently serves as a site of first asylum for more than half a million Syrian refugees. Although I framed my project as a comparative study between two distinct nodes of the refugee resettlement process, it's important to remember that only a small percentage of refugees living in so-called countries of first asylum, such as Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey, will actually be offered the opportunity to be formally resettled abroad through the United Nations. Nevertheless, I find the comparative framework useful in that it challenges the tendency to treat refugees as a homogenous population, and instead illuminates the contextually specific barriers faced by the particular populations that I work with at each field site. Today, I will use a socio-ecological framework to discuss the ways in which reproductive health after displacement is shaped by structural contexts, shared experience, experiences amongst particular populations, and individual level factors. Before beginning, I want to give an overview of my methodological approach. So I spent 14 months conducting ethnography and qualitative interviews in San Diego. And then in September 2019, I began my current ongoing field work with refugees living outside of camps in Jordan, where I have been living thus far for nearly 26 consecutive months. I've been especially lucky that many of the Syrian families I initially worked with put me in contact with their relatives currently residing in Jordan. So although I'm conducting research at two different sites, many participants in both locations belong to the same extended family networks, which has allowed me to establish long-standing relationships of trust and friendship with families in both locations. This dynamic has also offered unique insights and opportunities for comparative ethnography. My methods include person-centered interviewing and ethnographic participant observation, both of which remain relatively underutilized in the field of uh, refugee studies and specifically studies of refugee health, although they offer unique advantages for the, stu for the study of these topics. Person-centered interviews are conducted in series over time with a single research participant and differ from the semi-structured interviews typically used in public health research in several significant ways. First, person-centered methodologies adopt an analytical framework that views the narratives recounted by the interview participants as co-constructed by both the researcher and the interviewee. In contrast, studies employing semi-structured qualitative interviews usually treat interviewees' responses as objective reflections of that individual's opinion and perspective, or alternatively, as neutral descriptions of sociocultural norms, values, or beliefs shared by a community the interviewee belongs to. The impact of the researcher's presence on the responses provided by an interviewee is typically not considered during data analysis. Conversely, person-centered approaches do not view an interviewee's responses as a neutral reflection of some internal or external reality. Rather, responses are understood to be actively constructed narratives. Both the form and content of these narratives are influenced by numerous factors, including the respondent's mood, recent events, the interview setting, or even the language in which the interview is conducted. For example, different aspects of identity and morality are organized around and evoked by the use of each of the two or more languages the respondent uses. Person-centered interviews are conducted with the same respondent over time in order to allow researchers to observe shifts and inconsistencies that may occur in the way the interviewee constructs their responses. 
when inconsistencies are observed, it's not because the interviewee is, to put it crudely, lying or intentionally deceiving the researcher, but rather the presence of narrative inconsistencies reflects a fundamental shared aspect of the human experience, and that the stories we tell ourselves and others about who we are are constantly being rewritten and transformed by our daily life experiences in ways that are sometimes subtle and sometimes dramatic. Person-centered approaches that allow researchers to attend the dynamics of the interview that are important in any context, but especially critical to understand when conducting research with displaced populations. Although many studies in refugee health are conducted via interpreters or members of the research team who speak the participants' language, relatively few studies adequately consider how the identity of the interviewer and or the interpreter may influence the responses given. <clears throat> For instance, when re researching adolescents' use of contraception in a community where premarital sex is socially unacceptable, participants might be more reluctant to disclose their own experiences engaging in premarital sex if interviews are conducted through an interpreter from the same community. Furthermore, conducting interviews over time illuminates narrative shifts and inconsistencies that may reflect transformations in the way an interviewee positions himself in relation to the social norms and cultural values of both the host society and the country of origin. Such transformations are rarely unidirectional, unidirectional, but rather a complex, constant process of negotiating with and redefining one's own identity, values, and beliefs in relation to multiple contrasting normative models of, for example, what it means to be a successful woman or a good mother or what an ideal family looks like. In addition to person-centered interviews, I employed the classic anthropological method of participant observation, which is generally defined as taking part in the daily lives of research participants to the full, ex fullest extent possible over an extended period of time. Much of my participant observation took place in clinical and humanitarian settings, where I interacted not only with refugee women, but also with those providing them with medical care, social services, and workshops designed to promote refugee women's health broadly defined. In San Diego, I accompanied research participants as they attended family events, prenatal appointments, and even gave birth. <clears throat> in Jordan, the coronavirus pandemic has limited opportunities for this type of participant observation, although I hope to resume clinical ethnography in Jordan this year. <clears throat> Though the pandemic limited my in-person research, the lockdown offered opportunities for a different type of participant observation as a volunteer with several local NGOs who conduct research on reproductive health among Syrian refugees in Jordan. While working remotely, I analyzed qualitative interview transcripts, drafted reports, and attended meetings with international research partners. This unexpected opportunity offered in-depth insights into the processes through which knowledge about Syrian refugees is produced within the larger structures of the humanitarian research economy. <coughs> I took a COVID test yesterday for my flight. It's negative, don't worry. Practically speaking, participant observation has to offer, has much to offer health disparities research because it allows the ethnography to capture the mundane aspects of everyday life that are often taken for granted and may remain unmentioned during qualitative interviews. For instance, when I first began clinical ethnography in San Diego, I was struck by the difficulty of navigating the US healthcare system with limited English proficiency. The smallest tasks were immensely complicated by language barriers, such as figuring out where to park and how to pay for parking at a med major medical center, finding the correct building, and checking in at reception. Yet despite the fact that communication barriers seemed to complicate every step of the process, during interviews, women almost never mentioned language barriers as a challenge they faced when seeking healthcare perhaps because they faced these same difficulties nearly every day, whether they were going to the grocery store or attending a parent-teacher conference. As such, participant observation was an essential part of my methods and allowed me to gain additional insights into the larger context discussed by interviewees at my field sites, which I will describe briefly now. San Diego is home to approximately 1,300 Syrian refugees, the vast majority of whom were resettled in the US in 2016 and thus have been living in San Diego for about two years at the time which I began my field work. In Jordan, 80% of refugees live outside of official UN refugee camps, mainly in the governance of Mafraq, Amman, and Erbid. <clears throat> Over half a million Syrians are official, officially registered as asylum seekers with the UNHCR, 
However, the actual number is estimated to be much higher, at least over 1 million. Life for unregistered refugees in Jordan is extremely difficult and documentation, documentation status is one of the social determinants of health that I will now discuss. <coughs> I will use a socio-ecological framework to categorize and compare factors that shape reproductive experience at four levels, the individual, interpersonal, institutional, and systemic. For the sake of time, I've chosen to discuss one or two factors at each level in detail, focusing specifically on those that have received relatively less attention in the literature, but I'm happy to discuss others during the Q&A. Hmm. Individuals who are not registered as official asylum seekers with the UN face extreme hardship compared to re registered refugees. Families who are unregistered are ineligible for cash assistance, food coupons, government subsidized healthcare or other services provided by the humanitarian sector, and their children are usually un un unable to attend school. In addition, unregistered refugees often live in fear of being deported back to their country of origin. Refugees who entered Jordan after 2012 via official border crossings were transported to Zatari and later Azraq refugee camp, where they were registered with the UN as asylum seekers. After arriving in the camp, the only way to leave was to be sponsored by a Jordanian citizen or to sneak out through extra legal channels and risk deportation if caught. Despite these risks, over 1,600, six, I'm sorry, 160,000 Syrians are estimated to have fled the harsh living conditions in Zatari camp without authorization, effectively voiding their registration. Refugees who entered Jordan outside of the official border crossing were able to present themselves to UN offices and request asylum without penalty during the early years of the war. However, some avoided registering with the UN for fear that it might compromise their ability to return to Syria if such data fell into the hands of the Syrian government, giving that registering with the UNHCR as a refugee was tantamount to publicly taking sides, something that many Syrians did not wish to do. Although Syrian refugees <coughs> are often <coughs> treated as a homogenous category, Syria is an exceptionally diverse country and regional differences are often relevant to understanding health and health behaviors. For example, the majority of Syrian refugees in Jordan came from the province of Dara, which is located on the border between the two countries. Cross-border net networks of trade and kinship predate the drawing of the border in 1916 and remain active today. These strong cross-border relationships are a significant, a significant resilience promoting factor for some refugees arriving from Dara, particularly those residing outside of camps in the northern regions of Erbad and Ramtha. Regional differences are especially important in relation to two aspects of reproductive health that have been a central focus of the humanitarian response in Jordan, namely early marriage and fertility rates among Syrian refugees. Nevertheless, few studies adequately account for regional differences in explaining these phenomena. For example, although most sources suggest rates of early marriage among Syrians have increased since their displacement, <clears throat> uh, these studies rely on national level data sets from pre-conflict Syria and do not account for the significant differences in rates of early marriage that exist between Syria's various governance. In fact, a recent insightful study by Sieverding et al. argues that rates of early marriage have remained largely unchanged for the specific populations of Syrians living in Jordan, most of whom migrated from regions with rates of early marriage that were already much higher than Syria's national average. The authors conclude that even if displacement has not statistically increased the practice of early marriage, it has led to a qualitative shift in the drivers of early marriage within a context in which young women, married and unmarried, experience new forms of vulnerability unique to the setting of displacement and at the same time often lack the same sources of social support that were available to them in pre-conflict Syria. At both my field sites in San Diego and Jordan, I was struck by how frequently providers, humanitarian staff, and even the general public referenced what they saw as the problem of high fertility among Syrian refugees. Early in my research, I encountered this figure, which offers a dramatic visual, visual representation of the difference between the fertility rates of Jordanians and Syrians living in Jordan, 2.6 and 4.7 respectively. I sought to understand whether this difference reflected pre-conflict fertility preferences 
access barriers in Jordan or other factors associated with displacement. <clears throat> Superficial comparisons with national level data from 2010 suggest that fertility rates have increased since displacement. However, as we saw with early marriage, such comparisons do not account for regional differences in fertility preferences. Although I could not locate data on total fertility dates, total fertility rates at the government level, I used data from the 2006 multiple cluster indicator survey to compare rates of contraceptive use across governance and found that 57% of reproductive age married women in Dara were not using contraception at the time of the survey compared to 41.7% of those surveyed nationally. Next, I looked at unmet need for contraception and I found that 21% of respondents in Dara desired to space their births or limit their family size, but were not using contraception at the time of the survey. Finally, working backwards, I calculated the percentage of those surveys surveyed who were not using contraception and did not desire to limit family size or space their births at the time of the survey, which was 36.1. These data suggest that access barriers resulting in unmet need contributed to low rates of contraceptive use in Zara. However, access barriers do not account for the 36% of respondents who were not using and did not desire to use contraception, suggesting that a preference for large families may also play a role. <coughs> Sorry. These are only several of many individual level factors that shape reproductive experience after displacement. Social determinants of reproductive health at the interpersonal level include providers' attitudes and prior experiences, factors associated with the patient's relationships, not only with her spouse, but also with her extended family um, and her spouse's ex extended family, the availability of supportive social networks, um, the climate potentially of Islamophobia and or anti-refugee sentiment, and the presence of culturally, ethnically, and or linguistically similar immigrant communities. I find this final factor particularly interesting as it can affect displaced individuals' experiences of reproductive health in both positive and negative ways. For example, refugees who are resettled in communities of similar ethnic, cultural, or linguistic background may benefit immensely from their neighbors' collective knowledge and guidance as they adapt to the new environment. However, researchers have also highlighted the ways in which on a structural level, residents in so-called ethnic enclaves can also have negative effects on health due to the quote, concentration of poverty, lack of resources, and exposure to environmental risk factors. On an interpersonal level, relations between existing immigrant communities and newly arrived refugees are not necessarily supportive and in some cases may contribute to an unwelcoming or even hostile environment in healthcare settings. For example, while San Diego's Iraqi community has mobilized to support Syrian arrivals in a number of significant ways, some healthcare staff and providers also express their resentment of what they described as Syrians' refusal to assimilate to American social norms in the same way that Iraqis had. <clears throat> in Jordan, which hosts large populations of Iraqi, Somali, Sudanese, and Yemeni refugees, humanitarian and health service providers are often understandably frustrated with the disproportionate amount of aid and services earmarked specifically for Syrian refugees, while refugees of other nationalities receive significantly less report support. In this context, Syrian refugees are sometimes stereotyped as entitled in comparison to other refugee populations and seen as taking advantage of subsidized services. One provider, example, one provider for example, remarked that Syrians, more than any other nationally, nationality, come to the clinic, quote, just for fun because it's free for them. <clears throat> Among the many factors that shape reproductive health at the institutional level, Relatively little has been written about how refugees experience the bureaucratic structure few minutes? Okay. of the US healthcare system. The researchers often focus on how culture shapes refugees' health behaviors, the organizational culture of healthcare provision in the US is equally deserving of analysis. The highly regimented, uh, strict this highly regimented strict schedule that structures healthcare provision is statistically speaking far more anomalous than the quote polygonic orientation to time that is found in most societies worldwide. Patients who arrive late to appointments may be, may be treated rudely by clinical staff and are forced to reschedule as a way of quote teaching them to be on time, even when reasonable accommodations could have been made. For example, when I accompanied a San Diego participant to her first trimester ultrasound, 
and she requested a female ultrasound technician, we were told by the receptionist that, quote, if she wanted to make special requests, she should have arrived on time. Ironically, we had checked in at 2.43, two minutes prior to her 2.45 appointment time, which was clearly written on her appointment reminder card, which she showed to the receptionist. Apparently, the receptionist had previously explained over the phone that it was necessary to arrive 30 minutes prior to the appointment to prepare for the ultrasound. However, the explanation had been in English and she had not taken the time to set up interpretation for the appointment reminder call. Obviously, late arrivals cannot always be accommodated. Nevertheless, if we make accommodations when possible <clears throat> and stop treating patients who arrive late as if, they are as if they are less deserving of respectful care, we could significantly reduce the barriers refugees and other patients face when seeking care with very little effort. <clears throat> Numerous structural factors may impact refugees' reproductive health. These range from a political climate to material infrastructure to immigration policy. A recent study conducted by Doctors Without Borders suggested that stricter immigration policies may lead to higher rates of violence for refugees who enter the country via extra legal channels. The same study found that more than half of the incidents of violence reported by migrants were perpetuated by European state authorities, including police and border control. These authors conclude that exclusionary policies designed to reduce migrants' ability to reach and seek asylum in European nations ultimately increase migrants' risk of exposure to physical or sexual violence, and they urge policymakers to consider how immigration restrictions further exacerbate this population's vulnerability to exploitation and abuse. <clears throat> so in my talk today, I've briefly discussed only some of the factors that shape reproductive experience after displacement. I'm happy to answer questions about these or any other aspects of reproductive health um, during the question and answer session. Thank you. Okay. Well, could somebody get um, Dr. Chalmers some water? That would be great. Yes. Um, and um, are there any questions or comments from the room? We have about um, three minutes. Um, yes, um, Tala. Morgan, first, I want to commend you for your courage, for your work in Jordan, <clears throat> and for all the great work that you're doing, really. Um, it takes such courage to work in that part of the world, and you are doing it, so we're very, very proud of you. So, Morgan, my question for you, um, having worked with families in Jordan, and, you know, those are either the same or extended families here in San Diego, can you tell us about um, or some ideas on what can we learn in the U.S. from the Jordanian experience when it comes to uh, dealing with refugees in the healthcare system. What can we learn like from the U.S. implemented in Jordan? No, here in the U.S. What can we learn oh, okay. from Jordan's response to refugees? Um, I think it's a good question. Um, I think, I mean, just thinking about the healthcare system more broadly and kind of like the dynamics of the clinical interaction in Jordan compared to the US, it's very different. I think your question kind of gets back to the point I touched on at the end concerning kind of like bureaucracies and, you know, scheduling and like all of the like extra steps you have to do um, in the US just to like submit your insurance documentation before your appointment, like 48 hours before. I think just thinking about, I mean, I mean, even personally, as a person who seeks healthcare services in the US and in Jordan, it's so much easier for me to get healthcare in Jordan. It's so much easier. Like I've had so many just getting normal and as someone who's like intimately familiar with the medical system here, I think we could learn a lot looking at how just very basic services are much more accessible at a, at a much lower cost in countries like Jordan. Um, whereas people here are like, even to get something relatively simple, like a lot of the time they just won't go to the doctor because they don't want to have to face the, the many, many barriers of how to make the appointment and how to submit the documents. And, you know, it's just, I mean, even like things like figuring out how to park and where do you go to the machine to pay for the parking? A lot of people haven't had to do that before. So I think just like the the ease of getting basic services in Jordan is better than it is in the U.S. and it shouldn't be that way. Thank you. Um, Dr. Shardash has a question. And it has to do with the, the people that you're working with. You met people in Jordan through people in Syria. And so in, in some respects, you're not doing a transnational comparison of two separate groups, but you're doing an ethnography that's a transnational ethnography of, of a single extended community. Can you say a little bit more about what, what that's like and, and 
the um, the extent to which this really is one uh, transnational group and how they interact with one another and how often and, and in what detail they interact with one another. Sure. So, I mean, I think practically speaking, what it's like is every time I go back and forth between Jordan and the US, I have two big suitcases that are like full to the brim with stuff to bring back and forth. Um, like I have to bring a lot of the families here, they've finally after a few years been able to like, they're a little bit better off financially. So I'm bringing like 10 laptops into Jordan this trip back and it's like I'm trying to figure out how to get through customs without having to pay fines on these and stuff. So I think just like the, the way people maintain their connections um, through WhatsApp, and through also like finding, there's a lot of connections between Jordan and San Diego. Like everyone almost always knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who's going back and forth. So people will send stuff, they'll send even food, like homemade food, like they make shotta and they have me bring the shotta with them. Mm. So it's like a, like a hot sauce. Um, but yeah, I think people are, are particularly excited that after they get their citizenship, after they've been here for five years, they may be able to save up and travel back to the Middle East and also be able to potentially um, put in like a um, like a family reunification request in order to bring family members here. So that's a, a big part of my ethnography, mm -hmm. looking at that. Great. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation.